This is the second of three videos that I'm doing on Bloodborne. The first was about the good parts of the series and what changes Bloodborne brought, for better or worse. This one will be a walkthrough of the entire base game looking at every level and every boss. I'm going to speak about things as we go through each section, so I want to give a warning that some of this will simply be describing what happens in the game as you play. This is both so it's easier to understand the points I make, and so people who haven't played the game can follow what's happening. Having said that, I do recommend that you play the game yourself first, but I know full well that a lot of people can't justify getting a PlayStation 4 for just one game, or like to watch these videos without having to play the game. I always approach games in the Soulsborne series in the same way. I try to avoid all the information that I can on them before they're released. I then play them blind without any outside help. I tend to find a weapon that I think feels good to use rather than one that has super powerful stats or anything. I never use items unless it's strictly necessary. I also never summon other players or NPCs to help on bosses. I go through the whole game solo with my own mini set of rules here. After completing the game, I let myself look up some hints for things that I missed and complete the rest of the content in the same manner as before. I've had an incredible time with every game in the series while following these rules. I'm only mentioning them so you have an idea of what my first experience with all of the games is like and how it might be different than yours. The game starts with a scene that plays out from your character in first person. You're told that you're entering into some sort of contract to get some pale blood. It's not really clear what's going on. You go through a character creation menu which is apparently this contract that you're signing. You witness some fairly unsettling imagery and are then swarmed by these evil babies called the messengers. Believe it or not, by the end of the game you'll end up quite fond of these little guys. I think they're sort of cute now. You wake up alone and abandoned in some sort of hospital. There are a few messages on the floor to follow like in the previous games, but this is not a tutorial area. You're meant to walk down the stairs and get promptly murdered by a werewolf. You die and respawn in another area called the Hunter's Dream. This is the game's central hub. It functions identically to the Nexus in Demon Souls. It is physically separated from the rest of the game, and the only way to leave here is to teleport out using the giant tombstones nearby. You warp to lamps in this game instead of bonfires. Now already, there are a few things I dislike about this. Without a central location in the game, there's nothing that resembles Firelink Shrine, a place that many of the other levels circle back to, with shortcuts and paths to open leading from there. The level design in Bloodborne is great, but the larger world design is still subpar compared to Dark Souls 1. In fact, I'd argue that the way all the different levels fit together is only barely better than Dark Souls 2, it's just a bit more clever about how it hides all of the divergent paths. The other problem is that I think the game uses this lack of connectivity as an excuse to not tell you a damn thing about your goals in the game. People have complained that Dark Souls 1 is a bit vague, but at least there you have the intro cinematic and the prophecy to guide you. Here you're even told not to really think about it all, and instead just go out and kill monsters. Don't think too hard about all of this. Just go out and kill a few beasts. It's for your own good. Ultimately this is fine, but I think that the only reason that the game gets away with it is because there's only one way out of the first area. There are no multiple exits to places like the Catacombs, Ruins of Dulando, or the block shortcuts in Valley of Drakes and Undead Church like in Firelink Shrine. I really miss that about the first game, how there was this larger world around you that you could explore and get lost. It's more focused than Bloodborne, which admittedly some people might vastly prefer. There's also no version of the Asylum or things betwixt. There's no tutorial sequence of combat encounters that teach you things with enemies and messages on the floor. Technically, you could say that the werewolf functions in the same way that the Asylum demon does, since when you leave the Hunter's Dream, you do so after choosing a weapon so you can easily kill it. Instead, this area is crammed with messages on the floor that were overwhelming for me, a guy who has put hundreds of hours into the series. I think this is a poor introduction to the game and that this could have been done far better. I wonder if the intention was solely to make it easy to start new runs of the game instead of easing newcomers in. It's a shame that some middle ground couldn't have been thought up. So you can't level yet. There are a few things in the Hunter's Dream that are locked for now. You choose a starting weapon here. Like I said in the previous video, I went with the Hunter Axe on my first playthrough which I was convinced was borderline overpowered by the time I finished the main game. I looked online after I was done to see people praising the cleaver and cane just as much, so I guess this choice is fairly balanced. I didn't use the other weapons as much so I can't say for sure. You teleport back to the clinic you woke up in and go down to fight the werewolf. The best way to kill this guy is to just spam your attack button and keep him staggered. He doesn't have a full HP bar. It's possible that this is meant to teach you that attacking relentlessly is a good way to get through combat encounters, but I think that's overanalyzing it. Although I'll do my own bit of overanalysis on this guy a little later. Try to remember this wolf. 
I think it's more likely that this is only here to teach you that death isn't the end, and that there are no limited lives. You may have also noticed that your bloodstain is a hell of a lot smaller in this game. This is another change that I don't really understand. It can be surprisingly difficult to find this little thing sometimes. Welcome to Undead Berg 2.0. It's a lot prettier this time around. I know I said it in my last video, but it's worth repeating. This game is downright gorgeous. It's one of a few games that my wife will sit with me just to watch me play because it looks that good. If you've watched my Dark Souls 1 critique, then you'll know I'm critical on the stories in this series. I won't be speaking much about it in Bloodborne, but one thing that this game nails is atmosphere. I might not buy into the game's story, but the city? Absolutely. Yarnum is dripping with details, from the streets that look like they've been abandoned in a riot, to how this is a place where death can't be taken for granted. There are so many coffins that weren't trusted to stay locked and closed, they had to be chained as well. This is a place with so many of these things that they've been left in the streets. Levels in the Soulsborne series can usually fit into one of three categories. Maze-like, with many different paths that often layer over each other on different vertical levels. A concept or trial, some sort of unique mechanic that requires you play it differently in order to win. Or traditional, straightforward, easy to understand, and mostly about combat. Yarnum immediately sets the standard for Bloodborne, that it's going to be mostly in the first category. It starts off slowly, however, and eases players into the concept. It can also be seen as a slowly boiling pot of combat encounters that steadily increases until you reach one of the bosses in the area. Initially, things are simple. You're confined to this small strip of streets. You meet your first human enemy, then you run into two more. These guys are inactive at first, and it's gently showing you that not every enemy is going to be standing about sticking out for you to notice. You need to pay at least a little attention. There's a lock gate here that I think most people won't really think about looking at. It's the glowing loot that draws your attention, which also happens to be right next to this lever. You pull it, a ladder drops down. You climb it, and hey, there's another lamp for you to light. There's a guy you can speak to through a window that I missed until I came back here later. He gives some advice on what to do, but you're still left to basically stumble your way through on your own. Although it does help to make the city feel populated, I don't really like how often the game has you speaking to people through doors and windows. It feels sort of forced, but it does build into the idea of the hunt that is happening. This is the second part of the game setting. Yarnum is a city that's addicted to the power of blood. Tonight, people are turning into beasts. There's some sort of infection of lycanthropy loose in the city, and tonight is when the whole place is going to hell. People have shut themselves inside at dusk, and already the streets are wrecked. As a hunter, your job is to go around clearing the city of beasts, and those on the brink of turning into them. There's another closed gate here. This time I think most new players will notice. You only have one path forward to the right. There's a guy that bursts through some clutter well ahead of time so he doesn't ambush you. There's an optional path to the left here to fall down and kill another guy, or you can continue going to the right. This doesn't change anything, but it's opening you up to the idea that there will be multiple paths around, and places to drop down from one street to another. A lot of central Yarnum is like this. We'll go to the right for now. There's another duo of enemies. Not a big change from what we've dealt with so far. But up next is something that is not only new to this game, but also to the whole series. Bloodborne has a lot of patrols. Many of the areas use them actually, and I'm surprised that they're introduced in such an extreme way here. There's a veritable mob of guys roaming around that can easily kill you if you're caught in the middle of a battle. My guess is that these guys pose quite a challenge to those brand new to the series. Transforming our Hunter Axe works wonders here, we can use the longer range to take them down. To the left we can unlock the gate near the ladder that we call down. This isn't a useful shortcut, but it helps in giving you the impression that you're opening up some of the streets. To the left here is Bloodborne's version of the Black Knight. This is an optional challenge that is a significant step up in difficulty than the rest of the enemies in this area. This guy looks imposing enough that he's a cool challenge. Unfortunately, he's a good example of two sorts of attacks that the game sometimes uses that I absolutely hate. A quick slam and a grab attack. The grab attack doesn't seem so bad at first, but the more I see enemies with it, the more I don't like it. My reasoning is that it doesn't function like any other type of attack in the game. Instead of there being a wind-up that results in some sort of attack that you need to avoid, the enemy instead enters this active state and runs at you. If your model's touched, then the attack lands on you. There's no animation to dodge or any chance to avoid the actual grab part. It's handled by the animation afterward. It's not a big deal, but it just doesn't feel right since you're not dodging the grab itself, just this active state on the monster. The slam is his headbutt. From the start of the animation to when it hits you is about 9 frames, which translates to just under a third of a second. This is comfortably in the realm of being dodgeable, but only if you instinctively hit the dodge button when you see the guy flinch. There's not enough time to reasonably notice the attack, acknowledge what it is, and then decide whether to dodge right away or not. 
These kinds of attacks can lead to trouble if the enemy does a different attack instead that requires a better time dodge, but I'm curious what others think about this sort of thing and maybe that I'm the only one that has a problem with it. The only other way to go is back up the street. There are a few more human enemies waiting in ambush to test your skills at studying your surroundings while you move forward, including a guy that I always forget about and get hit every single time. This area around the giant beast that's been burned at the stake is another spike in difficulty that's comparable to the Executioner. There are a lot of enemies in this area, and you're shown the first type that will shoot at you. Like the patrol, I think this part would be quite challenging for a newcomer, especially since it also introduces dogs at the same time. Chances are high that you'll explore this area carefully after the first time you clear it out. You'll likely notice a large set of doors with something banging on them from the other side. I have never seen these break open. It's enough to get your curiosity going, and on the other side, you'll meet a lone enemy that's a fairly tough fight at this early part of the game. I think the introduction to this enemy draws your attention more deliberately than most others, so that you're more likely to find it and kill him while he's alone in this empty, safe space, since this level expects you to kill two at the same time toward the end. There's another set of human enemies and dogs, complete with another patrol, across the courtyard here. You'll also come across the first set of Roaring Crows. I love these enemies. I think they're hilarious and they're pretty easy to kill if you have a weapon with some range on it. There are two paths from this section. The clearest one, after you beat the dogs and the patrol, leads up to the bridge where two werewolves are waiting for you. The hidden one is behind some breakable objects. The game has been putting loot and enemies behind these before now. This path is the easier loop back around to the gate that you saw next to the lamp. If you go the other way and cross the bridge instead of fighting the werewolves, there's another opportunity to use this lesson about things hiding behind this type of clutter. This leads to a secret area in the sewers below. There's a set of armor down here that's a huge upgrade from your starting set. This also shows a strange part of the game. This is arguably the best set of armor in all of Bloodborne, because it doesn't really matter. They all have different variations of roughly the same stats. This could be argued as a way that the game is streamlining its features, since it wants to focus on weapons and mobility instead, but then you have to wonder why even bother with it and just have cosmetic items instead. Why does the game still bother with weapon durability as another example? Two werewolves are likely beyond new players. The other path takes you past some dogs in cages and through a house with a gun crazed guy in a wheelchair. Already the map you're trying to build in your head, consciously or not, is probably becoming strained, so it's a welcome relief when you open the gate and see the familiar lamp. It's another click of the level fitting together, although you do have to wonder why your character couldn't have opened this gate from the other side. This is the first of many shortcuts you'll open in the game, and it's a good return to what made some of the levels memorable in Dark Souls 1. Unfortunately, this concept of locked doors and elevators is used too much in my opinion, but that's something we'll get to later. With this gate open, you never have to go through the other street ever again. You avoid the patrol and the big mob around the werewolf barbecue. From here, you have a much quicker route through the dark house to the bridge. Now, to your right, are the werewolves. There's no real good reason to ever kill these. To the left is another one of those big guys with a brick and a congregation of roaring crows. Behind them is the path to the first boss. I think most players are still going to try to kill those werewolves, and this part of the game feels a little unfair to those people. Fighting both of these guys is surprisingly difficult. They're aggressive enough here that even if you're comfortable with the game, it's overwhelmingly likely that you'll get zoned back into the dark house. They can't follow you in there, and they get stuck in the door. This happens so naturally that I'm left wondering if it's intentional. It seems like a strange oversight in a level that's been otherwise so carefully constructed. Let's finish up the rest of the area for now. There's one final path we haven't explored yet at the dogs in the cages. This leads to a warehouse above the other part of the sewer street. The enemies down here are slightly more difficult versions of the humans above. They've progressed to a later stage of lycanthropy. There's a secret area here where you can meet your first fellow hunter, Eileen the Crow, and she gives you as warm a welcome as you're going to get in this game. In the sewers you'll fight some rats and also find that some enemies seem to be undead in addition to beasts. The saw spear is down here which also allows players a second weapon before they have to commit to killing a boss, which is good if they end up not liking their first one. There's also a madman's knowledge down here which can be used to unlock the ability to level up a little early. Insight is a secondary currency in the game that's like humanity in Dark Souls 1, only you don't lose it when you die. It equates to how in tune you are with the horrific forces at work in Yarnum, and changes how you perceive the world in minor ways. At one insight, the doll in the hunter's dream comes to life, unless you spend echoes in order to level up. The usual way to unlock this is by seeing one of the first bosses, which automatically grants you one insight. If you die to them, you even respawn in the dream so you learn to level up. 
Continuing on, there's more than one way out of the sewers. You can climb a ladder to open up another gate in the courtyard where you fought your first guy holding a brick. There's also a path through a long tunnel where you come across the first giant pig in the game. Climbing up another ladder nearby will eventually lead you to another bridge. There's an elevator here that takes you back up to near the lamp. This is another street next to the dark house that has two of the big guys with bricks. Back down the elevator is a bridge with a giant mob and a burning ball that is pushed against you all. Both of these encounters match the duo of werewolves as the culmination of the enemy groups in this area. They test your ability to dodge multiple attacks and either use superior range to wipe them out, burst one down to make it easier, or lure them apart to sneak in hits while you can. These fights are challenging at this stage. The big guys are pretty fair since they have significant delays after many of their attacks. The mob on the bridge is mostly a test of your reaction speed to dodge the burning ball. The werewolves I think are purposefully unfair for reasons that we'll get to later. Across the bridge is the next boss, which you could argue is the real first boss since the one we skipped earlier is optional. And that's it for Yarnum. If you haven't played the game you might be surprised to know that this first level is one of the most complex ones in the entire game. It's quite large for one and has many hidden routes and paths to learn. I think it also has one of the highest amounts of shortcuts to open with the gates and elevators. The first levels in these games always tend to be like this, very well designed and full of more ideas than what comes afterward. So let's talk about Cleric Beast and Father Gascon. Both of these bosses are prime examples of the two main archetypes you'll be fighting at the end of each level. A fast-paced, layered fight against a human-sized enemy, or a struggle against a big rampaging beast. I like both of these fights, but they're far from perfect. The larger problem the game has is that reusing these types of bosses results in a lack of variety in these encounters. Individually, however, the issue with them at this stage in the game is that they're too difficult for newcomers to the series. They're also too easy for those who have played the previous games for an extensive amount of time, but providing a challenge for those people requires some fundamental changes like difficulty options. The reason that they aren't good for new players isn't so much that they're hard to dodge or anything, but rather that they have to be handled very differently than what the game has had you doing so far. Exploring Yarnum is rewarded with caution and careful play, especially with the focus on waiting for openings in the multiple enemy fights near the end. If you approach Cleric Beast and Gascon in this way, with dodging their attacks and then attacking in an opening, then you're likely going to get wrecked. It's still possible to kill them this way, and it's even satisfying to do so, but the far more effective way is to charge in and become just as aggressive as these bosses are to you. Cleric Beast is a fight that's partly ruined by the area in which you fight him. Camera can often get caught on parts of the bridge around you. He also displays one of the great sins that many beast bosses commit in this game, jumping up in the air and vanishing with no reasonable way to keep track of them before crashing down on you. It's possible that this fight is here to teach you more about leveling up in the Hunter's Dream than it is about attack patterns and avoiding them all but in the end your best bet is to try to stay behind him while attacking as much as possible. After you kill him you discover that it was mostly for nothing. You get a badge that you can use to purchase a weapon in the dream, but the lamp and door here lead to nowhere, which feels like cut content. Or an alternative path to sequence break through part of the game instead of going for Gascon, maybe you were originally meant to choose between these two. As for the hunter himself, he's best killed with a similar method. The arena here is crammed full of things to get in your way which can make quick stepping difficult. I wonder if that's intentional to encourage you to try to parry him instead, or dodge close to him and continue your attack. This works the other way however in that he can often get stuck on all of the tombstones and you can get some easy hits in. Parrying is near overpowered on some bosses and this one is no exception. Once again this isn't a great learning experience for new players in my opinion. In Dark Souls 1 you're informed about how to parry and immediately given an enemy on which to do it. You don't get that from the isolated messages in the dream, which might as well be a long checklist of things to try that you should write down if you're brand new. It's also possible that Gascon being a hunter himself, who will use his own gun against you, is another prompt that's meant to get you thinking about using it back at him. Toward the end he transforms into a beast and becomes another rampaging enemy, like many other bosses. This is also introducing the idea of a phase change in a boss battle that several other bosses use in the game. It should also be noted that there's a puzzle solution to this boss that makes it easier. In Yarnum there's a girl who's been left alone in her house. Her father has gone mad and her mother has gone out looking for him. There are enough hints and clues that someone who is really paying attention can work out that Gascon is this father, and that using the music box that the girl gives you is something you should try during the fight. I did not work this out for myself while I played. With this boss dead, the way is open to the next area in the game, one that's initially much smaller than Central Yarnum, and branches off in many different directions not unlike Majula did in Dark Souls 2. The 
climb at Essential Yarnum is fairly short. A movie plays as an introduction to the chapel, which is kind of unusual for this series. There's a lamp and a friendly NPC in here who explains a little more about the hunt that is going on in the city. He asks you to send any sane people that you find to seek shelter in the chapel with him. Another NPC in the clinic where you started the game asks you to do something similar. She offers a reward whereas the chapel guy does not, which led me to believe that he was the better choice my first time through. As of now, there's only one person that you can collect, an old woman in one of the homes in Central Yarnum. The Cathedral Ward, at the moment, is quite a small area. There are many gates that are locked that you can't open just yet. Technically, you can purchase an item to get through this area early, but it's not something really worth discussing here. This location is a continuation of the city theme, although it's clearly a more wealthy section. There are a lot of statues around here, to the point that it stretches the believability of this place unless you're willing to accept the similar outbreak of a masonry related curse happened before this beast one. As with the rest of the game, it looks fantastic. The enemies here look like the aliens from Prometheus. They're taller humans that are a bit harder to stagger with attacks. There are also giant versions of them that are so tall that it's sometimes hard to see what kind of attacks they're about to do. You get a great view of Central Yarnum as you continue fighting through some enemies. It's here that you can find your first stat gem that, using an item you get after killing Gascon, can be slotted into your trick weapons for some bonuses. There's also a locked door here that I assume was meant to link with the area where you fought Cleric Beast, but it can never be opened, at least according to my Google searches. I really dislike that this door is still usable, despite never being able to open. It should be changed to be like all the other decorative doors in the game, no button prompt, no message. I can imagine some guy who spent hours of his life trying to work out how to get through with no result. This is kind of cruel for a game in a series that can be cryptic about its secrets. There's a similar bug nearby with this randomly spawning ball of light. If you go near it, you get flung rapidly into the air and then killed or spat back down. It's really weird. I don't understand how this made it in the final release of the game. There's only one path for you to follow, some stairs to another smaller chapel. There's another friendly NPC here after some more fights against some humans and dogs. The battles in this area ease up on the difficulty a bit from Central Yarnum. I also should have mentioned that, if you can beat Cleric Beast and Gascon, then I'd wager you've shown enough skill needed to go on to beat the rest of the game. They're the gatekeepers for progression in Bloodborne as far as I see it, although there are a few more bumps in difficulty along the way. Before reaching the next level, you'll meet the fourth werewolf in the game. It's waiting for you in the dark at the bottom of a staircase. It's quiet, and I think the way it's skulking about waiting for you, with its eyes glowing in the dark, is meant to be creepy. There's a lamp down here, and that's it for Cathedral Ward for now. We'll be coming back here soon. Old Yarnum is another level with the city theme, and already you might be noticing another minor flaw in this game. No matter how good it looks, a lot of it is similar. Even toward the end of the game, you never quite get away from these streets and places cluttered with tombstones. There are breaks from these environments, but they're too few in my opinion. But this is also linked with another criticism that holds some water, that the main game is too short. It's not a big flaw, but I do agree with it in some ways. We'll go into detail on these issues a little further into the video, but I want to mention now that it's alleviated somewhat by the Chalice Dungeons. Regardless, Old Yarnum is pretty good. It draws from all three of those level categories that I mentioned earlier. Parts of it are very focused on straightforward paths with combat challenges, there's a unique trial mechanic that changes how you play, and there are sections down here with hidden paths and shortcuts that make you have to understand how the area fits together. It also has the game's first bullshit moment. We start off with a note on the door that we have to read before opening it. If we don't bother paying attention, then a guy starts speaking to us after we enter the area to reiterate that we're not welcome here. Didn't you see the warning? Turn back at once. This place has been burnt in a fire and beasts now rule the land. To the left is the way we're meant to proceed. To the right is a hidden area that will become a shortcut back to the lamp toward the end of the level. There are also some enemies here that will put slow poison on you, which is pretty good as a learning experience since the boss here uses this same poison. I think the beasts down here are afraid of fire, but I never had any great need to use it. The enemies are more humanoids like you've seen already and don't feel any more difficult than what you've dealt with so far. Things change when you approach this area. The guy who spoke to you earlier does so again and, if you push on, he opens fire with a mounted Gatling gun on top of the clock tower. Now this isn't some mind-blowing mechanic or anything, but it's something new for the series and it's fairly enjoyable, fighting your way down this area while avoiding windows that expose you to the gun. It's also a good way to teach players to keep track of enemies close to you while also remembering about range fire from somewhere else. My first time through, I didn't notice these stairs here, so I just ran off the edge and fell, then raced forward under the gunfire, which meant I died here a few more times than I should have. There's a cool moment at the bottom with an enemy hunter that constantly tries to lure you back into range of the mounted gun. 
There's a secret here that I didn't find until my second playthrough, another dark area with some loot and a new armor set. I really like how many secrets are stuffed into these sorts of locations. It rewards exploration and feels natural that there would be a lot of places to find in a city. You pass a locked door and can either continue through a large church or climb a ladder to the left. This leads to some other hidden paths, but also to another ladder that takes you up to the Gatling gun. This enemy here, if fought at this stage in the game at level appropriate stats and gear, is the hardest fight in all of Bloodborne, and that includes all the DLC. And that's absolutely ridiculous and ruins a big part of this area. If you leave him alone, you can come back later and become bros with him, but I hate this guy so much that I always go out of my way to kill him. He's the first of many gigantic difficulty spikes that come in the form of bullshit hunter battles. These guys have the same tools that you do. Rolls, quick steps, trick weapons, and firearms. Most of them don't heal, but all of their blood vials are instead baked into their massive health bars. The difference is that they have infinite stamina and infinite ammo, which leads to some very frustrating battles that feel unfair. The most difficult part of this fight, however, is actually getting to kill him before the AI wigs out and he rolls himself off the tower and dies. This is one of very few moments in Bloodborne that I genuinely hate. Continuing on, you fight a mob in the church and reach the ground floor of Old Yarnum. You've explored most of the maze parts of this place now. You've also gotten past the trial mechanic. You open two shortcuts back to where the ladders were earlier and have to fight through a path with some more challenging combat encounters, specifically werewolves. So let's talk about them. This is the part that I referenced earlier about overanalyzing the game. It's something that I'm constantly paranoid of doing, since it's an easy trap for critics to fall into. The assumption that every detail in a book, movie, or a game is carefully measured and deliberate simply isn't true. I can tell you from writing myself that there are many happy accidents that can look like moments of genius when you don't know that they weren't done on purpose. So with that disclaimer said, let me do exactly that. I think the game tries to instill a fear of werewolves into you early on so that you can conquer that fear in this sequence. The first enemy that kills you is a werewolf, and if you don't spam attacks on it early on, it'll probably kill you again. It's an enemy that you barely kill even though it was already damaged. Then when you find two more later on, they're super aggressive and can't be split apart to kill individually. Bloodborne specifically wrecks you again with these same enemies, and if you use the doorway to cheese them, you proceed through the game with that guilt and worry in the back of your head that you didn't really kill them now, did you? What are you going to do if there's no door next time? The fourth werewolf is waiting for you, growling in the dark. This one is a more fair one versus one, but the setting here is clearly trying to be unnerving, just like the opening movie when you're suffering from sleep paralysis and have to watch it reaching for you out of the blood. Then you reach the bottom of Old Yarnum, and the game clearly says to you, no more messing around, prove that you can kill these things. There are five werewolves down here that you fight one on one, three of which are set up to ambush you if you're not playing cautiously and you will kill them. They're actually fairly easy opponents once you learn their attack patterns and know to stagger lock them down with quick attacks. I don't think it's a coincidence that the boss here is more werewolf sized than giant cleric beast sized and has similar fast flailing attacks. The game allows you to face and defeat your fear of this enemy right before it throws you against a tougher version of it to repeat that process all over again. Or maybe Fromm just thought it would be cool to have werewolves down here and I'm reading too much into it. Bloodstarved Beast is the first boss that feels very Dark Soulsy. Although it is yet another example of a wild flailing monster, it has easier tells than Gascon or Cleric Beast, at least I think so. Although that might just be that its smaller size means that you can see the whole thing on your screen. I think it's a good fight for new players and a better one for those returning to the series since it has quite a bit of health. It's more of an endurance fight than the other two, and you either need to get your dodge timings down or learn what side you need to stay close to in order to better avoid what he's throwing at you. Toward the end of the fight he starts emitting poison, and it's for this reason, when combined with that larger health pool, that I wonder if this boss is meant to be Bloodborne's version of the twin gargoyle fight. It's a DPS check, to make sure you've upgraded your weapons. There are a lot of bloodstones in Old Yarnum that are easy to find. When the poison starts ticking down, it can be seen as a race to kill him before you run out of vials, although if you've played the games a lot, you can stay away from him to avoid being poisoned at all, although it does prolong the fight. Conversely, the game goes so far with suggesting that you can use some items to make it easier that it puts some antidotes in the boss room itself. I've also read that he's weak to putting a fire buff on your weapon, which matches the theme of the area, but that's something I personally choose not to do. Sometimes I think that this guy should have been the first boss of the game. I think he's a better fit, but visually he's not that impressive and doesn't have that same wow factor that the other bosses do. Either way, I like this level. It's a bit simple when compared to Central Yarnum, but that can work in its favor. It's a break from that complexity. After killing Bloodstarved Beast, you receive your first chalice.
there are a couple of things to go through before we explore the rest of the Cathedral Ward properly. Firstly, I want to briefly talk about chalices. These are dungeons in the game that are their own separate line of progression from the main story. You use chalices with ingredients and echoes to create these dungeons. Some of them can be randomly generated. I'm going to be talking about these along with the DLC in the next video. For now, I want to say that Bloodborne becomes a much larger game if you mess around with these chalice dungeons. They have a unique setting, bosses, and enemies that you don't see anywhere else in the game. My suspicion is that you're meant to run a few of these in between story sections, and it might be a flaw that the game doesn't make that more clear. With Bloodstarved Beast dead, a door opens up in the chapel and cathedral ward for a reason that I don't understand. I don't know why these actions are linked. If anyone knows, please tell me in the comments, because I'm really curious. There's a badge up here at a locked door that allows you to purchase Ludwig's Holy Blade, which is my favorite weapon in the game both visually and for its moveset. Before we loop through the ward, you should know that there's an optional area nearby. This sack kidnapper guy has appeared outside the chapel, and if he kills you, you're abducted to another area. This didn't happen on my first playthrough, and I missed this, but it's only a tiny bit of content. You get to go there later anyway. Like in Dark Souls, being captured doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You're not stripped of your weapons or anything else. It's less offensive than the rules broken in Duke's archives, but still a little odd. You can get quite a few bloodstones in this area to upgrade your weapons to the next tier, so it's worth going through it. The sack guys can also be quite challenging until you learn to knock them down with visceral attacks before they hit you for massive damage. Dark Beast Parl is an optional boss here, but we'll be discussing him later on when we return to this area. Back in the Cathedral Ward, we have to fall through this tower. Platforming sections like this never feel good in the Soulsborne games, and I often wonder why they insist on including them. I'll admit that it's a memorable way to transition between areas, but the fact that it's so dark in here can make it awkward to judge the height of things, or if you'll even survive a drop at all. The games can be inconsistent about this sort of thing too, and don't always allow you to survive a drop to a place that looks like somewhere you can reach. Down here is a mini-boss Minotaur Werewolf thing that throws fire at you. I think this is the only place in the whole game that you see this enemy outside of Chalice Dungeons, but maybe I'm forgetting one. The real thing I want to talk about down here is the Brain Sucker. So the setup feels a little cheap. There's an elevator out of here that brings you to the other side of one of the closed gates near the chapel, but to open it, you have to drop down from this platform after riding the elevator, which means if you want to get back down to this alley, you have to go through the tower and fall down again. So it's best to explore this whole area first, which I imagine some new players will do when they find this drop. It's what I did. There's a brain sucker at the end of this alley. It's likely the first one that you'll meet. I like that it's introduced in a very modest way, when it turns out to be one of the worst enemies in the game. At least, if it's your first time through. I used to hate these enemies a lot more than I do today. I have some problems with them, but for this encounter specifically, I don't like how punishing it is to try and learn how they work. Their grabs and stuns are difficult to dodge the first time around, and you lose a lot of health and insight, which you can never recover when you're hit. If you die, you have to drop down the whole tower again. If you want to be safe and open the shortcut first, you still have to drop down the tower again. Today, they're one of the easiest enemies for me to kill, and I like that about the game. These guys were Bloodborne's version of Dark Souls Basilisks for me on my first playthrough. Dark Souls Basilisks, try, try saying that three times fast, holy shit. I felt an overwhelming sense of dread whenever I saw one. Now that I know how to kill them in a way that honestly makes them less of a threat than the standard humans in Yarnum, it's quite satisfying to have turned the tables. However, there are still two issues with consistency about this enemy that I want to talk about a little later, when we get to Bergenworth and have to fight another one. You open some gates throughout the Cathedral Ward. You fight more of the tall blue men, the giant versions, and another street area full of the same kind of enemies that you saw in central Yarnum. There's even some more people to speak to by knocking on doors. And this isn't bad by any means, but the setting starts to feel the same for me here. This is the fourth area in a row that's stuck in the city streets, and although it's as beautiful looking as ever, I would have liked some variety. The gameplay doesn't introduce anything new, but that's fine. The game's combat system deserves sections like this where you just get to fight and have fun with all the mechanics. The next area after this is Hemwick Lane, and it's a refreshing departure from the city. So much so that I wish the game had found a way to send you here directly after Old Yarnum. Maybe it could have looped back to the Cathedral Ward and could have been a good click moment. Before that, however, we should go to the Cathedral and take a look at the boss here. The guards around this arena can inflict you with frenzy, but they're pretty easy to dodge. It's worth mentioning that they can do it, but if you'll forgive the repetition, this is something that I want to speak about later. There are also two Hunter NPC fights off to the side of the Cathedral that are much easier than the guy in Old Yarnum, but still suffer from the same imbalance. Infinite stamina and infinite bullets. They can still be fun though, since you have a lot more room to maneuver during the fight, and it's a one-time challenge since they stay dead forever once killed. Let's look at Vicar Emilia, who has one of the coolest and strangest introductions in the series. If 
there's a boss that could embody all the differences in Bloodborne from Dark Souls, then it's Amelia. It's yet another giant flailing beast. There's a lot of fast, relentless attacks. Some people have been critical of Dark Souls 2 for overusing big humanoid bosses with large weapons, and they're definitely right to do so. These beast types are Bloodborne's version of this flaw, and if you haven't picked up on it yet, the lack of variety and challenge in the game's bosses is one of the most disappointing things in the game for me. Amelia is still a decent fight despite this, and she's a great learning tool for any Souls players that might have stumbled their way through some lessons before now. You can't really kill her in the same way that you might have approached Blood Starved Beast. If you're dodging all of her attacks and then weaving into Strike now and then, basically treating it like one of the tougher Dark Souls bosses, then you're going to be here for a long time, and you're not really taking advantage of all of the tools available to you in combat. You could make a strong argument that Amelia is the real DPS check boss, not Blood Starved Beast, to be able to deal enough damage to interrupt her healing phase or compensate with more attacks after she regains that health. More than anything though, it's just simply easier to hit her as hard and as often as you can to knock her down and kill her before she kills you. Playing it fancy with a lot of dodges doesn't fit well with that. The boss in Hemwick Lane is far worse. I really like this area, the visuals continue to be impressive, and like I said a moment ago, even with all the tombstones littered about, it still feels like a big change from the city. The human enemies here are easier to deal with than the ones in Central Yarnum in my opinion. There's the occasional Slenderman monster that appears, but they're also simple to kill. This is more of a standard combat area than anything else. There's no complex map you have to build here, although there are two shortcuts you can open up to skip some of these linear paths full of enemies. There's a small difficulty spike near the end when you fight more of those executioners with the big axes. I like that the game has these more straightforward levels as a break between the more complex ones. I'd even argue that Bloodborne could have gotten away with having a few more of these to flesh out the main story part. So it's unfortunate that the boss here is the worst one in the game. The Witches of Hemwick are monsters that you could have already seen and fought in the Unseen Village section earlier. In this room, they're invisible. You run around until you find them. You hit them a bunch. They vanish. Some of the Slenderman monsters spawn that you can mostly ignore. You keep finding the witches. You kill them. The end. This mechanic should have been used in the surrounding area instead to make some of the fights a little more interesting, and an actual boss could have been put here instead. I don't think this should even count toward the boss total in this game, which is already on the low side. Regretfully, this isn't the only lazy boss design in Bloodborne, although it's definitely the worst. You unlock the ability to use runes after clearing this area. These function like ring slots. There are also a lot of tier 2 upgrade stones here, so I think this is meant to serve as an alternative area for players to go through if they find Amelia to be too hard. You come through here, level up a bit, open your ring slots, and get a weapon upgrade or two, which should be enough to push past any trouble that Amelia might be giving you. I'd estimate that this is roughly the end of the first third of the game. In Dark Souls terms, this is about the point that you'd be ringing the second bell of awakening. The game changes after killing Amelia. You watch a movie that gives you the password to get through a sealed door in the Cathedral Ward. But the big thing that you might notice is that the sun has finally set. Night has fully begun, and the city is deep into the hunt. I suspect that this is an incomplete feature, just like some of the other strange parts of the game that feel like something wasn't really finished. Not much changes in the city itself despite the sun going down. In this area, those giant guys are now sleeping. That's about it though, nothing dramatically changes in the previous areas in regards to enemy placement or type. It's a shame because I think it could have made returning to those places and finding new things really interesting, like if some of those coffins had burst open with new enemies in them. However, you could also argue that consistency is more important, and that having the enemies remain in a familiar pattern is rewarding for those who really committed the time to learning those areas. The password. In any case, that locked door is the only way to proceed for now. It's communicated reasonably well with messages around the place, but only if you fully explore areas. That appears to be the best way to get through Bloodborne. Don't really think about any goals or anything, and instead just wander around killing everything and inspecting everything. We leave the city for the second time and enter a forest. This happens to be my favorite section in the base game for many reasons. Not least among them is that it's not another damn city environment. There are several distinct sections down here, and I think it's a minor flaw that this change in scenery wasn't immediately matched by a change in enemies. You're once again fighting those human guys from the first area. This is another problem in the game that's bewildering because there's actually a lot of enemy variety in Bloodborne, it's just poorly spread through the game. A lot of the different enemy types in Chalice Dungeons are probably things that many players will never see, which could have been used to spice things up in some of these areas. Anyway, despite saying how much I love this area, let me take an opportunity to talk about something else that I think falls short in this game. Something that I think some of you might disagree with, but I want to make the argument anyway. Maybe some of you will see where I'm coming from, 
Some of you might think it's really nitpicky though. If you've watched the whole video so far, then you've seen that every level incorporates shortcuts in some way. It's like they've taken that great quality from Dark Souls and focused intently on it. Many levels only use one lamp, and have been built around linking paths back to that starting point, you open new routes to the end and bypass areas that you've already gone through if you die. This is a more natural checkpoint system than simply placing more lamps all over the place like bonfires in Dark Souls 2. This is a great feature in the game, and the forest is no different. You enter here and have this scenic view of the moody, ruined windmill. You explore some side paths, but eventually end up at a lamp. You come to a locked door at that windmill, and you know immediately that at some point you're going to be coming back here through that door. And what I just said there became a little bit of a problem for me when I first arrived here, because with only one or two exceptions, these shortcuts are all the same. Locked doors and elevators. You're almost always shown them ahead of time. This was the door that made me realize how inevitable these loops had become, and while I want to stress, again, that they're still good, they don't lead to any of the cool click moments when you piece a map together in your head. There's no surprises like kicking down the ladder in Undeadburg, or coming back through an area in an unexpected way later. I would guess that a lot of players were surprised when the elevator in Undead Parish led them back down to Firelink. Dark Souls 1 had quite a few moments like this for me, Bloodborne only had one. It's in this area, but not at the windmill. There's a cave deep into the woods that's full of poison. It's one of the most annoying areas in the game because of the small maggot snakes that continue strong obsession with randomly flailing tiny enemies that have way too much health and deal way too much damage. Ignoring them, you go forward and find a ladder, which leads to another ladder. You emerge, wondering where the hell you're going, and realize that you're right back at the start of the game the clinic in central Yarnum. You can finally open a gate that you saw earlier, and can get to a new area. It was a great moment. Opening the door in the windmill, however, felt like I was just going through the motions. Like I said, I know some of this may be seen as nitpicky, and it's not a big issue, but I'd like it if some of these shortcuts were surprises. Unexpected, breaking down a wall or throwing down a ladder that you didn't see before. Some could be extreme like collapsing a building or something. Because seeing this door got me thinking the whole time that I went through the forest that soon I'm going to have to ride an elevator at some point and hit back to the lamp. That said, this level is massive. It puts a lot of strain on you both in terms of endurance, to fight through so many enemies in a row, and to map out the whole thing. There are many vertical layers to this place that make it fun to explore and put together, and it's probably the only place in Bloodborne that I could still see myself getting lost even after several playthroughs. There are also traps here, which have been absent in the game until now. They're introduced fairly well, and close enough to the lamp that they don't feel cheap if you don't notice the first one. It's a good warning. There are a couple of other minor shortcuts you can open as you move further down into the woods before looping through the base of the windmill. There's a transition here that I really like between the old enemies and the new. A human has his head burst open because it's full of snakes. You fight another one just like it. Then you get to the second part of the forest after linking back to the lamp and fight bunches of those same snakes. You go from humans to humans with snakes to just the snakes. I was expecting a boss at this point, but we're actually only halfway there. This is another huge area that feels different than what came before. There are a lot of snakes, and I really like that the game doesn't waste any time in upping the ante. You're likely still learning how to fight these small clusters of them when you find a giant set, which is far more dangerous and will spit poison at you. There are also patrolling humans that summon a pack of smaller snakes when you engage. There are also more pigs in the swamp area at the bottom of the forest, and if you explore all the side paths, you'll encounter your first group of mushroom aliens in the game. I feel like I'm not really doing this place justice for this walkthrough. I like this area because it was the only time in the game that I felt stressed by how many monsters I was killing and the size of the area I had to learn. However, if we back up a bit, you could argue that there is technically a boss here. It's the monster beggar I mentioned in the previous video. It's also one of the worst encounters in the game. This guy is another large beast that attacks wildly. He continues the tradition of bosses that act like Bart in that one episode of The Simpsons, when he tells Lisa that he's just going to wave his arms forward, and that if she gets hit, then it's her fault, not his. I was really negative about this fight until I got to fight him again in the Chalice Dungeons. I still think some of his attacks are cheap, but it's the arena that's the real problem. You have a lot more space in the Chalice Dungeon version, which helps so much. Here you have to constantly wrestle with the camera and be wary of the walls and falling off the roof, something that the beggar doesn't have to worry about. This fight is optional, however, and is actually a secret, so I don't count it too harshly against this area. The final shortcut is another elevator that links back to the windmill. It makes the corpse run to the boss one of the longer ones in the game. The boss is Shadow of Yarnum, and it's one of my favorites in Bloodborne. I really like when fights against multiple enemies are carefully built around that fact. Instead of just throwing two big guys at you and saying good luck, these three look similar but they all have different moves and tactics. A short range guy, a mid range guy, and a caster who stays at the back. 
You're not constantly overwhelmed by all of them charging at you, but you do have to keep track of more than one thing at once. It's expanding on the concept of the Gatling gun in Old Yarnum. I think that killing any of these guys first can work. The fight stays roughly the same difficulty for the second half too, since after you kill one, the other two become more powerful. When two are dead, the last one can start summoning giant snakes. The place these spawn at can sometimes be unpredictable, but I think it's meant to inflict panic in you to end the fight as fast as you can. The last guy standing shouldn't be too much trouble if you rush him down. This boss doesn't quite reach the heights of Alana or Dark Lurker in Dark Souls 2, but it's still enjoyable, if only because it deviates from the wild beast pattern seen so far. It also builds on the skills of keeping track of multiples that the woods have been teaching you so far, with lots of the slow moving snakes to watch and time your attacks in order to kill them. Like with the other bosses, you get a lamp in the arena after they're dead, which is weird because there's another lamp immediately after this. You move forward into Bergenworth. This is a small but important area. Two new enemy types are introduced that I don't think ever come back in the main part of the game. There are also a number of shortcuts to open around the lakeside manor that are apparently useless. It's a strange place, and I wonder if it's meant to make you uneasy by how odd it is. There's another brain sucker here. There are also the flyman creatures. Both of these break consistency in the combat system. Staggering opponents by chaining attacks is something you're meant to be doing throughout Bloodborne. Enemies and even some bosses can even do it to you. Both of these enemy types are frail enough that you can keep them locked down, yet they both break this rule when they enter certain states. The fly will start hovering in the air, which should make him more susceptible to being knocked off balance, but nope, he's now immune to stagger, and you'll likely get grabbed figuring that out. The brain suckers do the exact same thing when they start casting their ranged pellet grab. This is far more frustrating than it has any right to be, and if it's intentional to prevent the player from reliably staggering them, I wish there was a better way to show it especially if you dodge the sucker's first spell and start attacking before you realize it's already casting another one. The other issue this monster has is that it can sometimes chain spells in a way that will immediately hit you before you regain control of your character. This is straight up bullshit as far as I'm concerned, and along with some enemies being able to hit you when you're meant to be in a recovery state, must be a bug. I know that you can roll away when you get knocked to the floor, but some enemies can hit you when you're in this state and some can't, so even if you're meant to time rolls away, it's inconsistent for some enemies and it should be consistent throughout the whole game. It wouldn't be so bad except these attacks stun you into grabs that do an obscene amount of damage and forever steal your insight. Even if you kill the sucker after this, you can't get it back. I went back into the game to test this after I got to this part in the video, and after you get hit by the brain sucker's grab and you're getting back up after getting all the insight sucked out of your head, you actually can't roll away. You, no matter how many times you hit the dodge button, you, you just don't. You're locked into this slow recovery where you get up and yeah. So it's definitely an issue that you can't roll away from and that you have a chance of getting locked into this unavoidable hit if you get hit the first time. The other new enemy type is the synaptic nerve centipede monster thing, which looks cool but is also unfortunately buggy. It can hit you through walls. It's fairly easy to kill though and it fits the theme of this area. There's not much exploration to do in the manor. There's the next in the series of broken hunter battles though. This one can cast a spell that's random in both how it can hit you and how much damage it can do. Sometimes it does little damage and sometimes it one shots me. Like with the other fights of this type, your best bet is to be relentless in your attacks and parry spams. Try to keep these fights in mind for later on, they're good to remember for Bloodborne's final boss. For the end fight here, however, you're up against Rom the Vacuous Spider, which is a great addition to the ridiculous and awesome boss names in the Soulsborne series. I really like Rom, I like the introduction in the boss arena, seeing the moon beaming over the Great Lake beforehand is one of the game's best visuals. You're given a lot of space and you're likely going to need it. I'm not sure if I genuinely like this fight or because like Shadow of Yarn and before it, it's just because it's not another beast. You have to put some thought into how you approach it and it requires more than just spamming attacks. Rom is defended by baby spiders that become hyper aggressive if you dart past them and attack her. So your best bet is to wipe all of the little ones so you can have a safe time attacking Rom. But the baby ones have a strong directional defense. Their heads are armored so you have to attack them from behind or wait until they do a spike leap at you and get themselves stuck in the floor. A weapon with a sweep attack is great here since you can clip past their defenses from the side. But there's more to this fight. Rom will regularly summon magic rocks from the ground. Sometimes these fly up in a circle around her, other times they'll fall in a series at where you are standing. So you're tasked with keeping track of all of the spiders but also keeping an eye on Rom and learning each of the tells. 
If it's the circle one, run away from her. If it's the barrage from the sky, you need to start running and don't stop until the attack is over. If she starts thrashing around when you get close, dart away and then move back into attack. You have to do this three times, uh, killing all the babies and then attacking her before she teleports away. It ends up being one of the longer fights, which also helps distinguish it from the others. After she's dead, you see the ghost of Yarnum herself. A baby starts to cry and the moon looms overhead. It might be a cool story moment, but like I said, I won't be going into any detail on that in this video. Another change happens after this. The knight advances to the next phase and the moon becomes corrupted. If you only count the mandatory parts of the game, we're surprisingly close to the end, even though I'd say killing Rom is roughly the equivalent of acquiring the Lord Vessel in Dark Souls. There's a lot of side content to do though. The sky has once again changed, the moon has turned kind of evil. I like the different stages the sky goes through in the game, it gives it a lot of character. We wake up in an area next to the Grand Cathedral where we fought Amelia. We have a few things to get through here, but first I should confess that I lied to you earlier. When I spoke about the bugged ball of light that can kill you. After you're done watching, you might want to scroll down to the comments and see if anyone went into a rage fit and called me an idiot for saying it was a glitch. So killing Rom has pierced the veil or something. You can also see changes if you get enough insight. There are now things in Yarnum that have always been there, but you just couldn't see them until now. If we go back to the chapel, it's one of these giant evil insect human things, an amygdala or amidala as the game pronounces it. There's another in the room where you wake up after Rom, which you could have accessed before now. The door is open here which leads to the next level, but these giant monsters actually serve a purpose. The one on the chapel is the way you access the old hunters DLC. The one here is the route to a secret area. At some point in the game after Amelia, an NPC will take over the houses and windows in the game. He'll talk to you and give you an item with some vague instructions. You can read the item too for more help. I figured this out on my own when I first played by just going to this area and seeing what would happen. Basically, if you have this tonsil stone in your inventory, then the amygdala will teleport you to another location when it picks you up instead of killing you, just like the DLC key. There's a short area first that's some strange small university hallway with lecture rooms. There are these goop monsters that can swarm you. This is a good place to go if you want to see your frame rate tank. It's an interesting area because it's so unexpected, but it's only the appetizer for a much larger one. Nightmare Frontier is a grand departure from the rest of the game. It's one of three secret levels like the Painted World in Dark Souls 1. This might just be the largest single level in the whole game. If not, it's definitely up there. The fact that it's yet another location brimming with tombstones spoils it ever so slightly for me, but that they're apparently full of blood is a neat touch. The enemies here aren't so tough. There are some giants that throw boulders that require some additional strategic thinking in how you get through it all, and two more hunter fights that you only need to kill once. There are stages of progression here, since there are at least five large areas that lead into each other and interlink with an elevator, a toppled tombstone, hidden caves, and bridges. It would be one of my favorite areas in the game if it weren't for two reasons, although it's still a decent level. The first is that, like the bottom-up light town, there's a poison swamp that slows your movement speed. I don't consider this to be challenging in a good way even in Dark Souls, but I really don't like it in Bloodborne because it eats your healing vials the same way it ate your Estus. Even antidotes don't work here because you just get poisoned again within seconds. If blood vials refresh when you respawn, then I would be just as okay with it as I am about Blight Town. But because this eats into a resource that you may have to farm for, it gets a melodramatic thumbs down for me. The other, smaller problem is the only other bullshit moment in the game in my opinion. The way that it introduces Frenzy. This debuff isn't as bad as Toxic or Curse, but you might have to die to it a few times before you even understand what's happening. You also might start seeing the bar fill up if you get tagged by the guys outside the cathedral and then recover from it before it caps out. Here, however, it's introduced in one of two ways depending on where you go first. After a long fight through the poison swamp where you've probably spent a lot of healing vials and are still poisoned, or on a side path near the very end of the level but before you unlock the elevator shortcut so you have to clear back to it all over again. I'd be fine with this being a tough enemy that acts as a gatekeeper for the shortcut, but Frenzy is just a bar that starts filling up when you see these tumor head guys and unless you start running away immediately, it's going to cap out and deal massive damage to you. You have to learn that you need to charge at them and rush them down and then heal up before Frenzy caps and then heal again. The issue here is that opportunities were missed to teach Frenzy in a safe environment. Maybe with seeing Amygdala for the first time in the chamber room after Rom, you're at full HP, you look up and there's this enemy you can't fight. It could do the shining light thing that the tumor guys do from its head to build frenzy. 
you learn how it works, and there's nothing else here that deals damage that could kill you. If by some corrupted miracle that you do die, then you should respawn right here and don't lose any progress. Or you could have done something similar in one of the lecture rooms in the place before Nightmare Frontier. I think these enemies are actually pretty good, they're a different sort of encounter, it's only the way they're introduced that could be better. The boss here is one of the big Amidala guys. It shouldn't be the same one who sends you here, but since this is a From Software game, who knows. This fight is okay. I'm sorry to sound like a broken record, but it's another big beast monster that flails its arms around like crazy. You can kill this guy in two distinct ways, stay close to him and randomly flail back at his arms and head, and eventually he'll fall over, or stay far away from him and bait out attacks, then sprint in for some quick hits and then sprint out. Either way isn't that challenging. One is obviously more reliable than the other, but it takes longer. What's interesting about this fight though is that the enemy has weak points, you can't just attack his body or his tail or anything, it has to be his arms or his head, which is weird because I feel like this concept of weak points isn't really expanded much after this and isn't used as well as it could have been in the game. The other interesting thing about this fight is that you do it again in the Chalice Dungeon progression path. It's a lot more difficult there and goes to show you how much numbers can dictate difficulty regardless of attack patterns, because that's the only thing that's different, he has more HP and does more damage, his attacks are exactly the same. My plan is to talk about it briefly in the next video. Let's do one of the other secret areas before moving forward in the main story. Kanehurst Castle is my second favorite level in Bloodborne, and it's up there for many reasons. First off, getting there has a lot in common with Painted World. Remember the ladder from the Poison Cave? This is an alternative entrance into the clinic where you started the game. There's an NPC in here that you can kill that can contribute to the game's alternative ending. It's surprisingly unimportant and leads to a secret boss that is one of the worst in the game. For now, we're here to pick up an item. This unlocks the way to Kanehurst Castle in the same way that the doll opens the way to the Painted World. You go back to Hemwick Lane and approach this obelisk thing. A horse-drawn carriage shows up. Boarding it takes you to the castle. I love many things about this place. The first is that it also looks similar to Painted World, a cold, snowy castle. Your arrival here is equally nonsensical. It was a broken bridge in Dark Souls. Here the way is similarly shattered behind you and the horses that took you here are long dead and rotten. It's a surreal introduction that, like much of the series, I can't see there ever being a logical explanation for. However, there's more here to like. I don't know if Bloodborne does this out of tribute or an attempt to poke fun at it, but this level is very much like a DLC pack from Dark Souls 2. Even the name is close to a parody. You have a separate location, your arrival makes little sense, there's a boss here who is just some sort of lost king, there's a crown to collect and wear, there's also a queen to speak to. Just like the areas in those games, it's a kingdom that was once prosperous that has fallen prey to some disaster. I don't think it's as well designed as the Dark Souls 2 DLC. It's definitely better looking though. The interior reminds me a little of Duke's archives as well. All of the enemies are new to this location. The blood-sucking bug women outside that are, for me, one of the more difficult enemies to kill without taking any damage. There are more of these in the DLC that have consumed more blood that are easier to kill. Inside we have the little servants and the ghosts of beheaded women, or maybe it's the same woman who has several ghosts. They're not interesting in terms of mechanics, but standard enemies are fine, it's the animations tied to them that I like. The one bit of petty criticism I can lay on these are the dart spitter servants. I have a lot of trouble seeing the actual dart coming at me. Maybe this is intentional, but the other games usually make it clear when you're being shot at. It's not that big of a deal. There are a couple of ambushes from gargoyles posing as statues as you wander outside of the castle. I think this concept could have been taken a bit further in some of the statue rooms and maybe even in other areas in the game. These enemies are pretty easy to knock down too, which makes for less challenging fights. One of the game's better shortcuts is in this location. You open up a standard elevator route, but shortly afterwards, you loop through this study area and pull a lever to draw back a bookcase. This is a shortcut that isn't broadcast to you ahead of time, and while I know some people might think this doesn't matter, how much I enjoyed this unexpected reveal makes me wish more of the shortcuts were like this. Maybe I'm alone here though. Much of this level is fairly straightforward and mostly about combat. The path to the boss requires the same sort of ridiculous terrain climbing found in much of the series. It's like a running joke at this point. Why would the boss even have his throne up here on the roof? This is Martyr Ligarius, and he's a contender for my favorite boss in the base game. He's a humanoid that isn't a hunter. He incorporates a lot of spells as well as melee attacks. So no matter where you are in the arena, he has different moves to use against you. There's a decent flow to be found to dodging all of his magic and then avoiding his attacks. 
partway through, he enters a new phase and becomes more aggressive. He reminds me a little of Gwyn in this part from the end of Dark Souls 1. The standout move is when he summons a torrent of weapons that spew out at you. I died learning that you're meant to use your firearm to shoot at these instead of running in and trying to swipe at the weapon he leaves on the roof, or leaving it active for its whole duration and hoping for the best. This phase is more frantic, he suffers from the same parry cheese that a lot of the bosses do unfortunately. Killing him this way was the first time I started wondering if parrying is a good inclusion at all. I know that's a big change to propose and I'm curious what other people think of it. I know that you can always commit to a run where you don't use it, just like many optional features in the Soulsborne games, but just like I said in my Dark Souls 2 series, I wish there was a built-in challenge system in these games so you can do it officially, for lack of a better term. I think it could add a lot of replayability to the game. There's a little bit of extra content behind this boss that's kind of a secret, but I don't think it's worth going into in this video, it's not really that important. And that'll be it for the optional areas for now. There's one more, but we have to go back through the Unseen Village first. So this is the point in the game that you return to the part of the city that the kidnappers could have taken you to earlier. Because I missed that on my first playthrough, I only got to see one side of this place, and I had to wonder what all the broken lamps were about. It's a lot more surreal the second time, the whole place has gone to shit. This is the point where the game begins its rapid descent into madness, and in terms of atmosphere, it's nothing short of glorious. It's been a slow build until this point, and now there are monsters clinging to walls shooting lasers at you, enemies being conjured out of blood, skeleton jack-in-the-boxes, and the most revolting boss in the game that caps it all off. Although I do think it suffers a bit because it once again uses the city setting, it's helped by how twisted and corrupted it is. Even the name Yargul looks like a defiled version of the city. In terms of gameplay, however, things aren't so hot, or at least they're more conflicted, and I think that people's reaction to this area can also be heavily altered by whether or not they saw it earlier. The path to the first lamp is under the amygdala that takes you to the lecture hall. The game repeats a lot of enemy types here, and I like that. It adds some variety to the level, and it's a callback to all of the places you've been to so far. This level has a few hidden paths, but it's mostly a straightforward trial level, at least it is for the first half. You have to learn how to deal with the bell ringer summoning waves of enemies and the amygdalas leaving laser trails on the stairs. Both of these mechanics are best dealt with by sprinting forward with confidence to either get past the dangers or take out the root of all the enemies. The bell ringing is fairly clear, as is the red tint on the enemies to signify that they aren't truly real. This is used to lead you to a secret near the end of this gauntlet, since there are endlessly respawning enemies but no bell ringer in an obvious location. There's also a locked cage room with a door that you can only open from the inside, if you explore enough and put these two things together, you'll find a place to drop down to find this bell ringer and the loot. The key here is needed to unlock the way to the final optional area in the game. There are shortcuts that link back to the lamp at the start of this level, including a teleport and an elevator that were clearly meant to make a path to the street at the bottom and to the boss. But there's a second lamp here which stands out in my mind as the only time that the game gives you a second checkpoint so close to the first one. You could argue that some of the others in the game are just there to get your foot in the level or to obey the rule that killing a boss always spawns a lamp, but this one feels different. My theory for explaining this is that one of the most unbalanced rooms in the game is up next. You're thrown against not one, not two, but three overpowered NPC hunters. I don't know why the game doesn't have a different mini boss here instead of conceding and putting a lamp as a half ass attempt to make this room okay, but this is the only explanation I can think of. This trio makes me question the hard but fair ideal that the series is meant to stick to. This encounter can definitely be fun, it's chaotic as all hell, and you don't have to kill all three of them at once since they stay dead forever. But fighting all three of these guys at the same time is likely harder than every boss we've seen so far. One of these hunters has a grenade launcher that can be fired without any ramp up. It explodes for splash damage when it lands, and depending on how you level, this can be a one hit kill. Combine it with the other hunter that shoots a cool looking lightning spell and you can end up screwed no matter what you do. I don't know why the game feels the need to throw you to the wolves like this every so often, especially since it makes the rest of the game, which I'd argue is too easy, feel uneven. The box skeletons have claimed the street. There are a few ambushes here and some side areas to explore, but the path is mainly straightforward to the boss. These enemies are okay. Like a lot of things in the game, they're best dealt with a long-ranged weapon. They flail a lot, but that's the trend with a lot of the bigger enemies in this game. Before we talk about the one reborn, let's rewind to when we were here last time. There's another boss in this area that you can kill when you're abducted, or you can do it now. Dark Beast Parl is yet another rampaging beast boss, only this time with a zesty lightning twist. I don't think I've ever died to this boss, and because of this, he is the best example of that flaw that I keep repeating. Just keep attacking, and you win. 
If you hit Parl hard enough, he collapses into a heap of bones, and you just keep hitting him, and then he dies. I thought this might have been because on my first playthrough, I didn't see him until near the end of the game after I had leveled so much, so on my second time through, after reading about the abduction trigger, I went out of my way to fight him early, and it was the same thing even then, he just crumbles to the floor and that's the end. My guess is that he's more difficult if you can't initially lock him down like this, but then the fight simply becomes a dodge fest until you finally do land that starting hit, and then you just win after that rough opening. Or maybe this is a fight that's meant to be more difficult if you use a lighter weapon. It's a very strange encounter. Even stranger is that you open the way back to old Yarnum through a door behind him, which isn't that useful. It's nice that they're connected like this, but I have to wonder if these locations even make sense to be linked like this in relation to where you enter each area. The One Reborn isn't much better. His entrance is revoltingly awesome and suits the madness that has been increasing as you go through this area. Unfortunately, this boss is so easy that it might rival the Witches of Hemwick. The smaller enemies in the building around him make me think of the Tower Knight from Demon Souls, but in that game the boss was still, you know, an actual fight even after you killed all of them. Here I think you could kill this boss by accident just by hitting him at random after all the bell ringers are dead. It's a shame since this thing is so visually impressive, but I wonder if that was the problem. It was too difficult to attach fair attack animations that could pose a threat and also be understood by the player. If the game had a lot more bosses, then I'd be willing to forgive a more spectacle type encounter like this. As it is now, it joins the list of many others that aren't really worth their name and health bar at the bottom of the screen. There's a teleport after this that takes you to another part of the lecture hall that we were at earlier. This time you're on the second floor, and we're moving through here to get to another nightmare location. There are only two levels left. Let's continue with this part before the final secret area. So welcome to the final mandatory level in the game, the Nightmare of Mensis. Considering how much of the game is about birth and blood, and the moon in a corrupted cycle, the name of this area is a bold one. As you gain more insight, you can hear a baby crying in some locations as you play. This was incredibly annoying when I first played this game since I kept thinking it was my actual baby crying the first few times that I heard it. This level is quite long. It incorporates all three of the level types in the series in good ways. Your end goal is to climb to the top of what is effectively a tower. You start off far from it, however, and are given a good view of the whole thing as you approach. Then the lights snap on and you'll start taking damage over time that rapidly escalates. I really like this part of the game and I wish that it had been used more in this level. You have to break the line of sight with whatever it is that's shining on you from the distance. It can be a struggle to fight enemies here while trying to avoid the light, but the enemies are also affected by it, so it feels fair. The only way I can knock it is that the building frenzy meter takes a bit too long to fade when you're just running from cover to cover. I think this could have depleted faster after a few seconds to cut down on wasted time. The enemies in this first part are the same as you fought in the other nightmare level. There's a second lamp to light, but this isn't used for anything right now. You have a long way to go before the shortcut here can be used. When you reach the other side of the building, the trial concept ends. You don't have to worry about the evil light of Sauron anymore. You have spiders instead, which, given the size of this thing and the space you're given in this room, looks like an unfinished boss encounter. There are some more new enemy types here that aren't used anywhere else in the game. They're more humanoids, but since Bloodborne reuses the basic crazy humans from the first level so much, it's a shame that these couldn't have been seen in more areas. This part leads to a boss that many hate, and they are absolutely right to do so. It rivals the Hemwick Witches for the game's worst encounter. Mikolash is a guy that runs away from you. You chase him until he retreats into a room. Then you fight, then he teleports away. You chase him some more, he retreats to another room. You find a way in, and then you kill him. He has no unique moves or special tactics, just a few spells that you've already seen, and a melee attack. There isn't even a puzzle solution to cornering him either. He uses enemies to distract you and mirrors to get away. There could have been a mechanic built around smashing the mirrors or pulling levers ahead of time to close doors in order to funnel him down a direct path so he's cornered. Instead, he always runs into the worst location on his own. I'm not trying to say that these suggestions would make the fight good by any means, but at least it'd be, you know, something instead of what the fight is now. His cage helmet looks interesting at least. Thankfully, this isn't the final boss of the level. We're about halfway done. There are some more elevators to activate and a hidden path that you find by jumping off of one. I figured this out by noticing that the other cage elevator closed its door when you got on, but this one is broken. There's a window that you can jump through that leads to a long secret path. The game uses its elevators to hide quite a few secrets like this now that I think about it. There are more of the frenzy tumor heads here. You deal with them just like you did before. Partway along this route, you'll find a lever. When you pull it, you see a short movie with some huge fleshy thing falling into a pit. I'm pretty sure this is what was causing the big damage light earlier on, and I think it's a mistake that you don't get a chance to see it up close before getting to this lever. 
since I didn't even know what this was or what happened after I did this, it's possible that maybe I missed something somewhere, or maybe I was meant to go somewhere else before pulling this lever, but I don't know. Either way, if you continue on, you can find a Blood Rock, which is this game's Titanite Slab. It's the only one I found in the main progression path in the game, and it's a great reward for finding this area. It links back to the Mikolash boss hallways, so it's best to teleport back to the Dream, upgrade your weapon to the final version, and then teleport back to the lamp to continue on. Some enemy types are reused in this area, mostly the animals, which are just as twisted as everything else. Crows have the heads of dogs, dogs have the heads of crows, the giant pigs have too many eyes. There are cool little alterations that I really like. The Shadow of Yarnum bosses are also regular enemies here, although they appear to be nerfed. They don't get their special snake powers, at least not any that I noticed. You see the ghost of Yarnum again here, the one that appeared after you killed Rom. She's looking up toward the boss room. A baby has been crying in this area for a while now. After opening an elevator shortcut to the lamp, you can reach the top of the tower where an empty baby carriage is waiting. The boss here, Murgo's wet nurse, sort of looks like a demonized version of the crow from Dark Souls, or it might just be that her armor looks feathery. This fight is visually interesting. She has many arms and can attack very quickly. She reminds me of the last boss of Reaper of Souls in Diablo 3. There's a lot of forward arm flailing, but it feels to me at least more structured and understandable than many of the beast bosses. This might just be because it's easier to fit all of the enemy on the screen though. The most dangerous part of this fight is the smoke phase, where many versions of her spawn and attack you from different angles. Now I think this fight is almost amazing. Almost. I think her attacks are pretty good, and trying to stay behind her for some safe hits could have been a fun struggle. It's a little on the easy side, but then this chaotic phase could have helped that. Unfortunately, you can just run around and avoid all the attacks until it's over. If the fight had stayed in this phase until you do a certain amount of damage to the boss, then I think it would have been a lot more interesting and challenging. It's a missed opportunity to have a great boss to act as a climax for an otherwise good area. As an aside here, it always takes forever for the game to acknowledge that I killed her. The first time I got here, I thought it was leading to another phase or another boss. Does anyone know if this is a bug or if it's intentional because she's meant to be a big boss near the end of the game? So that's it for all the parts necessary to complete Bloodborne. For the final boss, we have to return to the Hunter's Dream. Before that, let's visit the Orphanage, the last secret area. There's one and a half bosses waiting for us there. We have to return to the Cathedral Ward for this part. It should be noted that if you saved a few people, that there are some possible events that can happen here throughout the game. There's a prostitute that can give birth to an alien baby. You can see a lot more of them in the next area. We have to climb back up the tower where we found the weapon patch for Ludwig's Blade. There are two phases to this place. It uses the standard shortcut system in Bloodborne by showing you a lock gate that you can open later to get back to the lamp. There are also some lock doors that open inside to bypass some enemies. Aside from the crawling alien things, there are no new enemies here. There are a lot of brain suckers and werewolves, which I find interesting because they're both enemies that are initially very challenging, but are easy when you master their attack patterns. I think this is the area where I finally got all the timings down properly. There are a lot of narrow corridors here to help you with that, to learn how to dodge through the sucker spells and to bait the werewolves' attacks and then keep them staggered. It's a small, simple, but challenging area that ends in an open courtyard full of flowers. Celestial Emissary is the boss here, and I say, boss like that because this is just a bunch of the mushroom aliens in a big room. It's like the Rat Pack in Dark Souls 2. Now I'm mostly positive about this encounter because I don't think it's an actual boss. I think it's misdirection. There's nothing interesting about this fight and it's lazily put together. This is here in my opinion because you're used to having a boss at the end of each level. You can teleport away thinking that you cleared it and are left wondering why a fairly tough level ended with such an easy boss. There's more to this place and it requires some experimentation. You need to smash a window next to the lamp to continue on. That another boss was in this area is the only thing in the game that was spoiled for me, so I looked around the courtyard and found this window after that. Other people might not be so lucky, and I don't think this is a good secret. This may come across as incredibly nitpicky, and I apologize for that, but the Soulsborne series is always inconsistent about things you can break like this. It comes across as totally arbitrary. Why can you break this window but no others? It's weird and a minor flaw, and I have no intention of harping on about it. Abritus, Daughter of the Cosmos, is a true boss of this area. Visually, she's up there as one of my favorite bosses ever, not just in the series, all games. She's both beautiful and repulsive at the same time, angelic and demonic. She's also a decent fight and is second on the list after Martyr Ligarius. She suffers a bit from being vulnerable to sticking close and spamming attacks, but if you stay at range, her moveset is varied enough to be interesting. I found her charge to be much easier to dodge if you break the lock and roll instead of quick step, and I like that you need to use more of your tools to properly fight. Same with running from her laser spikes or timing quick steps. 
but like Amygdala, she's more challenging in the Chalice Dungeon. Her blood spit is particularly nasty since it will max out your Frenzy Bar if it clips you, resulting in at least one blood while gone. It wasn't until I fought her again there that I noticed her charge can have some hitbox issues. This might be because of the tentacles behind her that move depending on what stage she is in the charge. Either way, this isn't something that should be in the game in my opinion. If you legitimately react properly and dodge in time, it shouldn't be able to hit you. There shouldn't be any unavoidable attacks like this. You get another chalice for beating this fight, and with that I think we're done. Only two bosses left which have no levels attached to them. Bloodborne ends where it starts, in the dream. The workshop here is on fire now, and I don't know why. You can also see that the sky changes in a different way than the phases of night back in Yarnum. German is waiting for you in a field nearby, which makes for a great looking battle arena. There are two fights here, and both of them are optional. German offers to kill you since the hunt is now over, and says you'll wake up back in the real world and can continue with your life. You can refuse and fight him instead. Afterwards, if certain conditions are met, a beast will descend from the moon and attack you. This means that there are three endings here depending on what you choose and whether you acquired three items while you played. Specifically, three-thirds of an umbilical cord. I don't think it's worth going into detail how to acquire these since they don't require much and honestly, in terms of gameplay, they're not really worth it. If you're into the story, then they might be, but that's not what this video is supposed to be about. German is a hunter battle like Gascon, and exactly like Gascon, he is highly vulnerable to parrying. Dodging is slightly harder, especially since he has moves that seem to blink in and out of reality in order to hit you. I personally don't find this fight that enjoyable or interesting, but I had gone through some of the DLC before I fought him, so I had already seen what I consider to be the superior hunter boss halfway through in there. What I do have to say about Garmin, however, relates to the rest of the game. See, the problem with this fight is the implications that it has outside of it. By that I mean, both Gurman and the DLC Hunter boss are far, far more fair than so many of the other Hunter encounters you have throughout the rest of the game. The guy in Old Yarnum, the trio in Unseen Village, or even the one in the manor before Rom. There's also one I didn't mention at the end of Eileen the Crow's questline who you fight in Amelia's Cathedral, who is so ridiculous compared to Gurman that you have to wonder if it was even playtested, or why their positions weren't switched in the game and he isn't the last boss. I don't understand why the game is like this, and keep in mind I'm not necessarily saying that these fights should be easier, they should be a little more fair, but I'd also accept German becoming more difficult so it makes sense, and a lot of the other bosses too. But even saying that, the way these non-boss NPC hunters move and parry makes them feel more like sloppy slapping contests rather than thoughtful tense battles. It's possible that I'm in the minority here, and I'm willing to be proven wrong, it's a point that I'm unsure about. I can't say the same about the boss quality in this game, which can be summed up neatly by Moon Presence after Gurman. In summary, it's another flailing beast. She has two other moves that don't mean much. She blocks your healing and can strip your health away, but you just keep on hitting her and that's all there is. You could once again argue that this is just a lore boss, or something to fit the theme, rather than a challenging encounter, but the game relies on this concept too much. We looked at 17 bosses in this video. Outside of DLC and Chalice Dungeons, that's all of them. From our list here, we can move them into broader categories. Rampage Beasts, Humanoid with Phases, Non-Applicable, and Other. These groups aren't fundamentally bad, but I think it shows how reliant the game is on one specific type, especially since I'd argue we can remove three of these from being considered bosses at all. This is the weakest part of the game, and it's disheartening to me because the bosses are the things I look forward to the most in the series. Having said that, if we review the levels in a similar way, then we see that, aside from wanting some variety early on, that the thing missing the most is just more of them, and I firmly believe that if the worst thing you can say about something is that, I wish there was more of it, then it could be viewed as a twisted compliment. I really don't want to end this video on a negative note, because I love this game. The more I wrote this script, the more I realized that it's my favorite out of all the Soulsborne games despite these shortcomings, and that means that it's one of my favorite games ever. This video didn't talk much about the combat system since that was the topic of the previous video, and I can't emphasize enough how enjoyable it is and how much Chalice Dungeons added to the experience. It may be seen as unfair to not include them in the evaluation done in this video, but I get the impression that many players have made a similar divide in how they view the game since much of the Chalice content is randomly generated. In any case, I hope that at least someone out there enjoyed this critique and commentary, since it's different than the usual type of thing that I do. It's closest to the first series of videos I did on Dark Souls 1, which I know not everyone liked. Hopefully there was enough here to make it interesting, and if not, maybe it's a fair summary for those who'll never have a chance to play the games themselves.
The next and final video will be on those Chalice Dungeons and the Old Hunter DLC. It should be more comparable to the first video in length. Thanks so much for watching. As usual, I need to plug my Patreon and subscribe button in order to continue making these videos. I try to put out three every month, and if there's something you like, there are links on the screen. Thanks for putting up with the same message at the end of every video. The amount of time they take means I have to promote these things at least a little bit. I hope you're all enjoying Dark Souls 3. I'll see you for the next one.